Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I am, as Dr. Siddiqui said, here to talk a little bit about um, the consensus guidelines for diagnosis. Um, I've sort of changed things a little bit um, with sort of my take on it, only because I'm, I'm finding there's a lot of repetition, um, which can get kind of boring. So uh, we'll see what, uh, where we go from here. Um, so disclosures, obviously, I have nothing to disclose. Um, I'm going to touch on a, a few other things as well that um, as far as the consensus goes that weren't, weren't um, talked about and just to make sure that we're all still doing the same things and, and within the same regard. Um, of course, the Doppler ultrasound machines, um, some people using the SEO taste, some are using others. Um, but as far as I know, that's, that's still fine. Um, of course, the probes, um, the linear, the um, curvilinear and the uh, phased array sector probe for the transcranial assessment uh, as well is still the same. Um, I haven't, uh, we didn't really discuss it, but nothing was brought up, so I'm assuming that that's uh, all still the same. Something else um, <clears throat> that wasn't touched on are presets. Um, first of all, for a color Doppler, uh, our PRFs uh, in that range of 0 0.5 to uh, 1 megahertz. Um, either the steering, um, of course, we're having this kind of discussion about um, transverse and sagittal and what it should be done in. Um, if it, anything is done in transverse, of course, the, the box is, is square or at zero degrees and uh, the sagittal plane, of course, you steer it and keeping within the 45 to 60 degrees. Um, gain, uh, something that we need to be mindful of, the gain levels. Obviously, if they're too low, there's incomplete color flow um, in conjunction with, with PRF as well. Um, and if it's too high, it's, it's a lot of noise and some aliasing. Uh, the spectral Doppler, again, uh, PRF, important, uh, you know, that we have the proper settings for that. Um, too low, again, there's, there's too much noise, too high, you're going to miss slow um, or low moving flow. Uh, wall filter, too, I, I, I looked, was looking through the consensus and from the last meeting, and this is uh, sort of the forgotten control. A lot of people, uh, I don't know why, but forget about wall filter. So that's just something that I, I think is important and, and need to be mindful of as well. I think as far as any changes to this, the sample volume gate um, of course stays in the middle of the vessel, but I, I think, uh, and it's been mentioned and suggested yesterday in our uh, break-off meeting, that perhaps we should be opening the sample gate um, maybe closer to, from wall to wall um, of the vessel and, and see what we get from there. Of course, with that you're getting um, all of the frequency or certainly a lot more frequencies and a lot more noise, but again with the adjusting of controls you can sort of manage that to get a a nicer uh, spectral waveform. So changes to the protocol from 2008 to now. Um, the original protocol compared to the consensus of 2011. Um, I'm calling her Dr. Sandra because I'm terrible with names. So um, she sort of covered that with a chart that she had listed sort of the old and the new. So I'm not going to um, beat that up anymore. Um, having said that, we, we do have an, an evolution of criteria and I think it's important um, there are some sort of things up for question as to whether we should exclude them, uh, the deep cerebral uh, assessment and, of course, anything done in transverse. I think we also need to remember, though, um, back to the basics is always a good thing. I think we're a little bit early to be throwing out, so to speak, um, the original protocol set out by Dr. Zamboni where everything was in transverse or um, you know, the deep cerebral assessment and things like that because it's just a little too early. I, I think with that and the changes of each of the criteria together is going to be a lot more valid than if we just sort of say, oh, well, we shouldn't do this anymore, we shouldn't do that anymore. I think we should build it, um, but perhaps use the old as, as, as a verifying sort of um, checkpoint, if you will. So I'm just going to go through each of the um, criteria and sort of say what it is and what's changed or what's not or <laughs> what I think maybe should. Um, so for reflex, um, again, it's for the internal jugular vein and varicose vein uh, interrogation. So we're going to now, do, well, as they as said last year as well, sagittal plane including velocities, volumes uh, from the J1, J2, and J3 areas. And I think this is where the verification in transverse should come from. I think the reflex should be looked at in transverse anyway. Um, reflex lasting longer than 0 0.88 seconds was the original. Um, to be considered a positive finding, suggestions have been that 0 0.88 perhaps isn't long enough. Uh, 1.5, 1.6 seconds is more realistic. I, I would have to agree with that. I've done a lot of ultrasounds and I, on this particularly, and I mean, it's lasting sometimes even two, two and a half seconds. So 
I think you know we should maybe be moving towards that 1.5, 1.6 uh, for sure. Um, the deep cerebral QDP, no QDP. Um, how do we analyze these findings? Um, this is where you really smart doctors are going to jump in and try to figure that out, I guess. But um, I don't know. Um, the consensus from last year, it says to still include it um, as one of the criteria through talks, certainly in the last couple of days. Uh, suggestions have been without QDP applications, uh, the assessment of the deep cerebral veins is difficult to interpret, um, suggesting that perhaps this should be excluded. But. Um, B mode, um, again, B mode valvular abnormalities uh, should be assessed in the transverse plane and the sagittal planes. I think sometimes to get a really good idea of where that malformed or thickened valve is, uh, leaflet is coming from, you know, it's, uh, it's important to, to sort of assess the whole entire vessel because there is lots of wall there. Um, the differences and things that have been suggested to change is that we're, we document, record, and, and, and perhaps classify these, these B-mode abnormalities, whether it be um, a septum or whether it be a, a thickened leaflet or et cetera, et cetera, instead of just saying, you know, sort of B-mode um, abnormality. Um, also suggested is that on the reporting system, perhaps we put a schematic drawing on there to, to indicate exactly where on the, in the vessel it is and what, what is happening. Um, Guidelines for the blocker or absence of flow. Um, again, it's absence of detectable flow in the internal jugular and or vertebral veins despite inspirations in both positions. And the absence of detectable flow in the internal jugular and vertebral veins despite inspirations and bidirectional flow in the other position, same side. Um, we didn't really discuss too much about this, so I, I would say that this pretty well stays the same. Um, and uh, this is the sort of uh, bone of contention uh, criteria, but anyway, uh, guidelines for cross-sectional uh, area. The cross-sectional area of the internal jugular vein is greater in the sitting position than in the supine position. That still remains, and I think um, with my reference to going back to the basics, we really need to remember that when you're assessing the cross-sectional measurement, that is really the, the bottom line, is in the sitting position, if it is bigger than when you're laying down, there's something wrong there. Um, doesn't really... <sighs> you know, matter essentially what area it's in. Um, the bottom line is it is, it is bigger and that, that is abnormal. That is not <clears throat> proper venous behavior. So that is something that I think we should first and foremost keep in mind. Um, the cross-sectional area appears unchanged despite change in position. Um, obviously that's also abnormal. Um, it's been suggested that instead of taking one measurement in the J2 area that perhaps we take um, three measurements at J1, J2, and J3 as well as at the narrowest point. The narrowest point obviously is going to be the area of stenosis generally. Um, so I think that's more in conjunction with the, the sort of B mode slash stenosis criteria as opposed to bringing it into the cross-sectional area. Um, I think if we do, do, do those three measurements in the supine position and, and uh, then again in the sitting position, it's just it's going to be a lot more um, data that we have to go on. and. Um, some people, maybe it will be J3, some people maybe at J1. But again, bottom line, if it's bigger when they sit up, that's a problem. Um, where <laughs> Do we measure in color or B mode only? Um, my take of this um, is that when we are, and this is just throwing out some ideas, so I'm not, you know. Um, when we're doing it in color, when I'm looking at color, I'm, lo I'm looking at patency. I'm not looking at size. So I think that when we're measuring the cross-sectional area in color and you're only, you're only measuring the area that's, that's filling, um, it doesn't represent the actual size of, of the cross-sectional area. I mean, you can, you can do it in reference to lower DVT, um, uh, lower vein DVT, or even a carotid artery um, if your uh, settings aren't such that the carotid artery is filling properly and, you know, the vascular uh, surgeon or the radiologist interpreting it, it says, well, what's the size of that carotid artery? You're not really just going to measure the, the color. You're obviously going to measure the whole entire diameter of that, of that artery. So I think that just on that principle alone, we, need to, we can't ignore the fact. The other thing, too, I gave a couple of examples, actually, with the white arrow there. You guys can see it. That's the example of the carotid artery. So as you can see clearly, that artery is there. If you were to measure that cross-sectional area, there's absolutely no way you're just going to measure that, that color flow there. Um, because it's, it's as clear as day that that's, that's the whole artery. 
<clears throat> I think if you start getting into that and doing it with color, like I said, it's, it's basically dictating patency. It's not dictating size. And if you're, if you're going to start measuring color flow, that more sort of leads into um, diameter and area reduction sort of school of thought as opposed to. So that's just some things that just food for thought. Uh, this is just another example, the arrow. I don't know what happened to the arrow, but it, got, it was really small. Anyway, this is actually um, a post-angio um, patient with a stent. Um, and you can clearly see that the stent is uh, thrombosed around. This is actually not a great picture, but it's all I could find. Um, and the somewhat of the lumen that's there, the red, again, this is a perfect example that, yeah, the, you know, it is going through and it, and it is somewhat patent to the point that there is a small lumen, but the actual whole size of, of that vessel is, is, is the whole, the much larger than that. So I think that we kind of need to just maybe think about that a little bit when it comes to whether or not we use color or just uh, in B mode. Um, okay, follow-up angioplasty. Um, we need to establish, and, and I don't know if this is a possibility that I will be able to walk out of here with uh, by the end of this conference, but we sort of need to establish, I think, as, as units of all of the, uh, the centers doing it, is the follow-up uh, protocol, the time intervals. Um, stenting, if, if patients have stenting, they definitely need to be followed up. Um, anybody with a, with a cardiovascular procedure, as far as I'm concerned, should be followed up. Um, anticoagulation rehabilitation. I know different centers have different programs at which they do. Uh, I know there's some centers that keep patients for two weeks, other centers it's just overnight. I, I don't think it has any bearing other than, you know, as far as rehabilitation goes, is the recommendations that anybody is, is giving these patients. Um, anticoagulation versus antiplatelet um, therapy. I, I don't know what the right one is, but everybody's doing it different. So, and I know this because I see everybody from every center and they all sort of then come to us and say, what do I do, what do I do? Um, we don't know. So, because they're being told so many different things. Um, flying post-angioplasty, I, I don't know. Is there a time that we should wait? Is there a time that we say, okay, you're there, you, you need to wait one week before you fly, you need to wait two weeks before you fly. Some people are flying the next day, they're coming home, they throw on bows. I mean, it's, you know, they blame it on you guys, like it's awful. So it's something that we kind of, I, these are issues that, and concerns that I think are, are really important, especially going forward with, with the um, consensus and, and the, uh, the guidelines. Uh, just some other brief concerns. Um, consistency in reporting uh, data where it would be great if we all had a worksheet that we could work on, which actually uh, a group of us are doing uh, this evening. We're getting together to try to see what we can do from, from different centers and hopefully come up with something that we can all use. Um, the changes in the protocol, um, when do we start implementing these changes? And um, when, again, when we walk out of here and we go home, we're going to continue to scan and I'm going to use what I know. Obviously, I'm going to pick up a few things that I, I've learned from here that maybe I wasn't doing, but you know, to standardize it, when does that happen? Does it happen the next time we have another meeting in a year? Do we communicate between? I'm actually going to skip to the next, but the fourth point there, it says, how do we evolve with the ultrasound to all be on the same page? Is there, is there a possibility of a website that only sort of the trained sonographers that we all communicate with each other and we can log on and sort of see who makes that decision, whether we change it or whether we don't? Um, these are sort of things. Uh, there was a, a couple of um, ex expressed concerns about some of the centers performing the treatment without a pre-angioplasty um, ultrasound assessment. Um, I'm certainly nobody to, to question anybody's integrity, especially a physician, so they can do whatever they want. Um, I, I think there's definitely a room, uh, there is, there's a place for ultrasound in, in this whole process. Um, I think that it's definitely, as, as what um, the main consensus that I've, I've seen here is that it is multi-modality um, for sure, but again, ultrasound does have its place. Um, all we can do, as, as actually Dr. McDonald had mentioned, is just move forward with the science the best that we can. Um, and hopefully um, there will be some sort of a, a protocol in that regard as to what steps patients should take. But anyway, um, the other last thing, of course, is training. Um, training is key. So I've said it before and I'll say it again. You can't just come here, even come to this conference and sit here and go home and think you're going to know how to do this or what you're even looking for. Um, so, it, you know, that's something to consider as well if you are wanting to establish doing this if you're not already. So um, I also wanted to add something just for a little bit of fun. Um, I've had some uh, buzzing around about, you know, oh, you know, this data, that data, people doing studies. So in Barrie, we, have, we are doing um, an approved IRB study. Um, it's an observational study only through Doppler ultrasound. 
So no, it's not correlated with MRI, so you're not allowed to bug me about it. But I just wanted to give you guys just a little bit of sort of raw statistics. This is nothing crazy, hasn't been analyzed by you know, anybody yet, but it was just sort of let you guys know as centers sort of what I'm seeing. Um, what I did was um, I pulled 90 patients randomly from my database that I have. We, I've, in the study itself, we're close to 200 people, but um, I call, I'm, I'm pulled 90 because these 90 people have everything that I need. Sometimes patients, they forget their OR report or things like that. So anything that was missing, I didn't include it. So this is why I chose 90, and this is just for fun. So just so you guys know. Uh, this actually, I, I, I see patients from every single center that does this CCSVI. I don't think there's one place I haven't seen um, a patient from in follow-up. Having said that, these, this is where I've pulled from. So out of these 90 people, this is just where they went. Um, I, I can say actually the two bottom ones that look really low, I, so many patients come from there, Baltimore and, and Brooklyn, but the two that I, unfortunately, this is the, but this just gives you an idea. I think another thing that this dictates too is that in Canada, a lot of people are trying to stick to the border. Uh, the best they can for traveling and flying and all of that concern. That's why I said we need to sort of figure that out, I think. Um, anyway, uh, so the MS classifications out of these 90 people, 17% um, of them had primary progressive, 19 obviously secondary, and 64 is relapsing remitting. <clears throat> so uh, the Doppler results, this is post-angioplasty, um, out of the 90 people, 22% have restenosed, 33% now have one out of five criteria, which in essence is still considered normal. Um, and 45 have zero out of five uh, criteria. So overall, it's about a 78% success rate. So um, that's kind of good news, I thought. Uh, as far as their, their symptom complex, an initial improvement sort of on the table. I get a lot of this on the table. It lasts a week, it goes away. Um, that's about 26% of people. No improvements whatsoever is 3.3. Thrombosis is 6.7 patients, and improvements is 64%. So um, in conclusion, uh, again, I just want to stress that we need to remember where we started and, and sort of not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, I also wanted to give you guys some feedback uh, as far as post-angioplasty, all the centers that do um, do the treatment. Not only are the patients very pleased with the fact that they got the treatment and they're able to have it, but they all tell me that every center they go to is absolutely wonderful. Um, they are treated very well. Um, they compliment the staff, the doctors, the bedside manner. They'll just go on and on about you people. So I just want you all to know that you're doing a great job, and, and I hear it everything. So it's it's wonderful to hear. Um, I work, you know, closely, sort of indirectly with a lot of you. So it's uh, it's really really nice. Um, and lastly, I just you know we need to um, also remember the patients. Um, that is why we're here. It's what we do. It's certainly why I do it. Um, and we need to remember that they are relying on us to continue forward with research and hopefully you know, we get somewhere, but it's because of them, and that's, we, ca we can't forget that. Thank you. Do you want to shut this off? I'm attached. Here we go. We have, we have about two minutes. So I'm always on time. I, I have a question. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, sure. Yeah, no questions. No, okay, go ahead. The purpose of the examination is for screening and uh, assessment. There's something that I'm not hearing about which probably needs a collaboration between the proceduralists and the sonologists and sonographers, and that is uh, it would be very useful to have both uh, bidirectional diameters at the three areas, especially not at the stenosis but at the confluence, number one, and number two, cross-sectional area is superior to diameters. So if if that information were available to the treating physicians, it would augment our ability, because some of us don't use IVUS, and we would be, have that information that would help select balloon sizes, et cetera. So we need to think about how mm -hmm. we can use this for more than just the diagnosis, but for treatment plans. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. I'll look at you all lining up for me. Um, yes? Mark, I have a question about the, the the level of skill and training that it needed for follow-up versus for initial evaluation. Because you know, people go home and they go into these, these deserts where people have no idea what they're looking for. But right. if, they, if they know they're looking for like, you know, thrombosis or stenosis here, maybe. And also, um, what kind of data would you like when doing follow-up from the treating center? From the center? That would help you. Um, 
Yeah, it, it's kind of a scary thing uh, when these people come back and they are going to facilities that, that don't know. As far as the training uh, post-angioplasty, uh, it's, it's, it's about the patients you do. It, it becomes, you know, um, quantity really. You, it's just like anything, right? So you, you need to keep doing it, keep doing it, and keep doing it. So I mean, I, and I think it's a learning curve over, over time. But if you, if you know the sort of protocol and, and what you're looking for is, as far as abnormality go on the diagnosis side, you know, you, can't, you do carry a lot of that over for the follow-up side. Thrombosis, I hope to God that somebody knows what that looks like. But I, I mean, I, other than that, I mean, that's just regular vascular, so I don't really, I can't really judge on that. Um, and what was your second thing you said to me? I'm sorry. Um, well, things, things that will help you. Right, of course. Um, on the report, what is super handy is, and, and actually everybody really well d does it quite well, is um, size of balloon, whether uh, it was medicated. I understand there's some centers doing medicated balloons. Uh, cutting catheter, these are all details that we, that we are sort of collecting as well that are going to make a difference too. So um, if there was any uh, unfortunate events that happened during it, if those things could kind of be, th that really helps us out. We've reached, okay. we've reached our, our allocated time, so perhaps you could ask those, uh, question, additional questions uh, privately, and, and if perhaps one of the other speakers is delayed, then we can come back to this, but we have to stop for now. Thank you so much. Um, our next... Oh. Angela, you don't have to run away. That was great. <laughs> our, our, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Hakey. And Dr. Hakey will review the uh, MRV consensus. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm just going to try to do something a little different than what Raj did yesterday, perhaps look at some future directions, but summarize some of the things he did as well with some example images this time. Um, I have grants from the university. I'm involved with several universities' grants from NIH. I also have involvement with MR Innovations. I have a research agreement with Siemens Medical Systems. I want to thank a lot of my students and postdocs and people who have helped because there's a lot of data that's processed generally to do this, and they've all been wonderful, helpful, and uh, wonderfully helpful, and also all the doctors who have been involved in sending data. So what's the motivation behind this? I want to talk about potentially four tiers, maybe even more than four tiers, in the sense that each tier might have some subcomponents. In the discussions that we had, I think uh, we don't want to really try to address the routine MS, what I'll call tier one, that the neurologists have very well defined to monitor lesions and to look for what they need to. I really want to talk about what we'll call the core CCSVI and beyond that, I'll call that tier two, to evaluate the 3D vasculature anatomically and to monitor flow, to categorize the type of MS populations perhaps by using the, uh, both the flow and the anatomic data um, and for this to serve as a baseline for pretreatment and to make meaning co meaningful correlations pre and post treatment. Tier three could be a little bit more detailed, adding to it uh, monitoring iron content, measuring cerebral blood flow, measuring oxygen saturation. And tier four could include other things such as diffusion tensor imaging, magnetization transfer contrast, maybe the azygous vein, because people think that's a little more difficult to image right now. So, um, sorry about that. Um, Emil, you'll definitely have to delete that other slide that's in there. Uh, so I want to talk first about the conventional imaging protocol, just to mention that a lot is done on the first pass for MS patients in both the, the head and the spine. I think the critical thing I want to point out here is that there's a spot in this for injecting gadolinium, and there's a five-minute delay listed there. And so what we're going to talk about in Tier 2 is taking advantage of that time and not adding much more time to what otherwise would be a normal protocol. If the patient does not get a spine scan, then it's going to even be faster than this, of course. So we want to keep things quick so that it can be adopted by many clinical sites. So of course, in the conventional scans, you look for the white matter lesions. Uh, you also look for T1 images, uh, pre and post contrast, so you can see the difference between acute and chronic lesions, actually so you can see the acute lesions. 
And so the next thing for us is how can we add to this and get as much information as in short a period of time as possible. The best way is to take advantage of that five minutes. We've injected a contrast agent already, which means we can just do a 3D time-resolved contrast-enhanced MRAV, as we've talked about before. Uh, we can also do a full-brain sagittal scan with a short TR. Now, this wasn't talked about at the um, consensus, but I'm just going to add it here as something for you to think about. And that is, this is a 1 minute and 20 second scan. It's much higher resolution than the time resolve scans because if you're going to do a time resolve scan in 5 seconds, you have to sacrifice resolution in order to do that. You might not even cover the whole area of, of, it, of the head or the neck or the, or the arch, for example. But you get the, the main jugular vessels in the appropriate veins. So having this other scan, as you'll see for a minute, is still almost free. So for those sites that are able to do that, that's something that could be considered. So in some of these um, slides I'm showing you, I say embedded no extra time, means they're just embedded in that protocol already. And then we can image the blood flow at C2 and C6, and that takes roughly about four minutes. And then if you do this extra 3D high resolution scan, you would have to run it again post contrast. And again, as I said, that takes about one minute and 20 seconds or one minute and 30 seconds. Total acquisition time then would be only about six and a half minutes longer. So it would be 45 minutes if you were doing the whole study in that case. And as we've shown before, you can get these wonderful arterial images. You can get the venous images. You can label all these images. And Dr. Zvadinov brought up a very interesting point, and that is if we can begin to see collaterals, well, we do see collaterals here. If you could label collaterals, if you could, could really carefully define collaterals, it may be that outcomes are more dependent on the presence of collaterals than they are just finding a stenosis, for example. So the 3D MRAV offers you that opportunity to do so. And so I just show you an example here where you can see on the first image you have a stenosis on the left side and you have an associated collateral. Now, I'm not sure exactly how I would count this because as you can see, it's a bit of a mess. You have multiple vessels coming in there, but in the end, it looks like you have one major vessel coming down through here that you might call a collateral. You might call some of these collaterals. It's hard for me to define, and that's something that you'll need to think about. On this image on the right-hand side, in this case, you can see a string stenosis for the right internal jugular. You have a mess here. You certainly have a major, you may have a major collateral, but these could be multiple collaterals. I don't know how to define it. Again, something we need to look at. But certainly, those are the types of situations when sometimes the interventional radiologist will find after treatment that the collaterals go away. And I'm wondering, in fact, maybe that's an interesting point. Maybe taking what uh, Robert Zavadinov has said and saying, well, this seems to correlate. If you also have the angio data, and you can show that in that individual the collaterals went away, whereas perhaps in another individual's the collaterals didn't go away, you might have even more important information. I'm not sure, but that's certainly data you would have available. That high-resolution 3D scan I mentioned gives you at least one cubic millimeter resolution of the whole head and, and neck, so you can reformat this to look very carefully at the transverse sinus and make sure that things that you might see if you happen to run a 2D time of flight, even though it's not part of this protocol, you can miss vessels that run in plane, you won't have that problem here because you have a contrast agent present. All right, so to do the flow quantification, you need to choose a region of interest. Well, this also brought up some discussion. Where should we do this? Roughly on the, the level of C2, you don't want to be too high. I think the important thing here is that you could have very low flow in the jugulars in the upper region because you have the facial vein and other veins there. Once you have the confluence of the facial vein with the jugular and you get below that, you have much more flow in the jugular. So if you're going to try to do comparisons of absolute flows in the jugular, where you're doing this is critical. So it was decided that it would be best just to collect these two regions, although there was also some discussion about imaging just above the valves. The problem that we've seen is if you try to tell people to image around C7, T1, sometimes they drop down too low, sometimes they end up in the valves. So from a, just to make this easier, being around 
C5, C6, C7, or say C6 is probably a much safer way to do that to avoid that problem. So you can also um, image the CSF. You can, um, we've been doing this at around C2, but as Dr. Zavadinov said, you can be looking at the aqueduct of Silvius to do this. And I think that's actually, from a research point of view, I think it's important to do. Uh, the region, I think, that uh, Marcella Lagagna had done it in the lower area was the area is much higher. And one of the biggest errors in measuring flow anywhere is the area. So if you have a large area, it's actually easier to get more accurate results. But the whole point about flow being conserved at that level compared to the aqueduct of Silvius needs to be investigated to see if that's true or not. So what can we do with flow? Well, I only show you two plots here, but there are many things you can do. One of them is to give the integrated flow. So in this particular example, on the left-hand side, you can see that this uh, MS patient is dominated by one vessel. And actually, that's quite common. I forget the exact numbers, but on the order of 20% or 25% of these cases, they show many vessels in the 3D contrast-enhanced image, but they don't show flow in all those vessels. Often, it, the flow is dominated by one of the remnant jugulars that doesn't have a problem associated with it. So you can also go back and see, well, what else is happening in that case? And you can see in this individual that for the left internal jugular, it really meets the Zamboni criteria in the sense that it's refluxing for almost half the cardiac cycle, and then it's returning, and then it's refluxing again. So you can actually study the dynamics of what's happening as a function of the, of the cardiac cycle. Sorry, I already talked about the CSF. So stage three would be looking at adding susceptibility-weighted imaging and perfusion-weighted imaging. To do that uh, will require about a six-minute scan for SWI, but it doesn't require any more time for perfusion because the perfusion's only a two-minute scan. So in that five minutes that we've talked about, you would have the perfusion for two minutes, you would have the contrast enhanced for three minutes. So when it's possible from a research tier three point of view to do a 5cc injection, do perfusion, inject the rest of the contrast, do the dynamic contrast enhance, and you would now have the same type of information available to you. So what do we get by adding susceptibility-weighted imaging? Well, you get the ability to mo monitor the iron content of certain lesions, and there are a number of papers out there now that are showing the more iron content you have, it may be a predictor for those who are getting worse, but I, I personally think that the iron is more of a representation of possible damage to the tissue already. We really don't know if the iron is exacerbating this or if it's in fact just a biomarker for damage that's already taken place. And we see iron in many structures, globus pallidus particularly. In this case, this is the caudate, the head of the caudate. And the interesting thing is we followed some of these people for two years and you can see this iron buildup going back and back and back exactly in the opposite direction to the venous flow, so very similar to what Paolo has talked about and especially to what Franz Schelling has talked about. You also see iron in the pulvinar thalamus, which a number of groups have shown. And then, of course, you can do the perfusion imaging. And perfusion imaging offers you cerebral blood volume, cerebral blood flow, and mean transit time. And, you know, people have been doing this. I haven't seen too much about mean transit time yet. I think it might be very interesting to pay attention to mean transit time, especially if there are some impacts of reduced flow or slower flow. It's something that's done in stroke all the time. Uh, it may be something that is revealing for multiple sclerosis. So what happens if we do that? Well, we're up to 51 minutes, so that's really not too bad. And if you're not doing the spine imaging, you're probably back down again at around 45 minutes. I'll be done in two. Um, so I just wanted to show an example of tier four. We'll just call it that for the moment. Um, imaging the azagus, in our experience, has not been that bad. We've done hundreds of cases of the azagus. We can show the same type of truncular venous malformations on the azagus. You can see the hemiazagus well. I think at another talk, Joseph Hewitt showed 3T rotating azagus and hemiazagus. It's possible to do it, but the problem is it takes 20 minutes to do it. In some cases, you may even have to post-process to correct for breathing artifact. But the good news is that there are some very rapid techniques being developed in MR today. There, you're going to be able to image a 2D slice in 100 milliseconds. So I can imagine the day will come where we'll, we'll do the entire azagus in that part of the body in about two minutes instead of the 20 minutes it takes today. But that truly is a research direction. I did want to point out that in the azagus, 
you can often see this compressed azagus or, or this pancaked azagus. And uh, if you take the volunteer, or in this case a volunteer, and turn them on their stomach and rescan them again, you have this wonderfully functioning, normal flow azagus vein. So that's kind of a functional problem. It doesn't really represent a, you know, a, a physical stenosis for the patient. Now the other final two slides I wanted to show is we haven't talked a lot about quantitative reporting. And I think it's very critical. People in neurology are quantifying total lesion numbers and volumes. They quantify gray matter volumes, white matter volumes. Uh, I, I, they look at lesions that enhance. In SWI, you can quantify the presence of iron and microbleeds and oxygen saturation changes. For MRAV, we've talked a lot about do you use 50% stenosis, and I think the conclusion has been you don't do that. You say, I think Paolo uses 30 millimeters squared, we've used 25 millimeters squared. You, you can't possibly determine a, a percentage of a jugular vein that can be one centimeter at the confluence or three centimeters at the confluence. So you really have to decide how we're going to do that. Uh, we should also standardize what we're going to quote for flow. Are we going to give you cross-sectional areas? Are we going to give you flow in milliliters per second? You've got to solve that before you get the radiologist doing it. And the same thing for, for perfusion-weighted imaging. So I think this is critical if we're ever going to get to the point of taking all of these quantitative measures and comparing them to EDSS or MSIS-29. So for future considerations, I think we probably have enough experience it would be nice to create a library of the different manifestations of CCSVI, and can we, quantify, uh, can we quantitatively compare now the results between ultrasound and MRI, even if we have to normalize the venous data to the arterial data, I think we should be able to demonstrate that the two can agree with each other. And uh, I think that's kind of the challenge that we have right now. Our goal is to uh, take all of these, this information we've developed here and to uh, write a white paper on this within the year before the next meeting. Thank you very much. Did I do good? Um. We have questions for Dr. Hakey. I have um, a question. Did the consensus come up with uh, a statement regarding the ability to visualize valves? Not really. There was some discussion of valves, and th there, there are on occasion the ability to see valves if they're stuck valves and the contrast agent is watched over time. Sometimes we can see a jetting effect in the first time point, and if you watch it over time, you can see it filling in. In some cases, if you're very lucky and the resolution is good enough, you can actually see the boundary of these stuck valves. But we don't have, at the moment, the capability in MR to do this real-time imaging of the flaps that, that are present here. Since the disease is largely an intraluminal patho pathological state, as we, we saw earlier with Dr. Fox, perhaps there should be a, a comment about it. Yeah, uh, actually, or the augmentation of the two procedures, the need for both ultrasound and yeah. MRV. Yeah, actually, that was one of the things that we did actually talk about. We said, well, basically, MR may or may not be able to see the valve. Um, if we can see the valve, indeed, you report it's there. If you see any ab um, aberrant circulation or any congenital defects, you, notice, you note that. But we didn't actually come up with, you must look for the valve. We said, if you see it, you report it. If you see any aberrant, there are actually three criteria that we actually talked about in terms of looking for any kind of narrowing, um, and that'll actually be coming out. I, I think also Sal's point was that if you can't see this with MR, you really need to be using ultrasound, especially given the importance of what Robert Fox showed, and that is that you are going to see these abnormalities in the vessels, and so MR is not going to be able to show these intraluminal effects and therefore, ultrasound plays an important role. David? I thought you were going to bite the bullet and give us an objective uh, combined uh, flow for the internal jugulars, uh, normal, abnormal. Uh, well, that's very, I'm going to give a talk tomorrow on that. But, <laughs> but and this was supposed to be a more general white paper concept. But that's the idea of quantification. What are you going to quote? When you have got all the information from the flow from all the vessels, you could quote total flow on the arterial side. You could quote total flow in the jugulars. You could quote total flow in, uh, that's remaining in the vertebral plexus called an arterial venous mismatch, for example. It might represent the presence of collaterals and other flows. But 
you know, this is not something we standardized at this point in the sense of the society. And uh, this is something we will put together in the white paper, however, and so we would be definitely looking for people's objective comments about that. Dr. Zvednov. Just to strengthen what, what Mark said, <clears throat> clearly our goal is with this protocol to have a good, you know, visualization of the anatomy, possible morphological stenosis. Definitely we will make very clear that uh, at this time it's not possible to you know, image intraluminal abnormalities and hopefully with the flow studies uh, to, you know, uh, 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 come up with some, uh, you know, criteria over time, the something that we can do at the moment in terms of what's, as David said, abnormal or normal, but we don't have ability on that at this time. Any further okay. questions? Thank you. Congratulations, Mark. So next uh, speaker is uh, Marion Simka, and he's going to present the consensus opinion on catheter venography. Uh, <clears throat> welcome, everybody. Uh, so. Uh, uh, Sal Sklafani was very pessimistic about the uh, consensus document on venography. I'm a little bit less um, pessimistic. Anyway, is consensus on uh, this issue at the moment possible? The problem is uh, that although uh, most of the doctors e agree on general venographic rules, what to assess and in uh, general how to assess these veins, Unfortunately, big differences exist between the centers in terms of details of this uh, examination. And the problem is that uh, at the moment we are lacking scientific evidence who is doing this examination properly and who uh, is doing it it's, um, uh, in an improper manner. And therefore, uh, now such uh, evidence-based consensus it cannot be created. So, uh, which uncertainties and controversies exist at the moment? First, vascular access. Uh, this vase can be uh, assessed uh, using either femoral access, and uh, alternatives are upper extremity or direct uh, jugular puncture. Also, regarding femoral, right and left side can be used. And it should be known that uh, regarding femoral access, pressure measurements in the internal jugular veins, if you use this femoral access, uh, may not be reliable because we uh, uh, simply displace the jugular valve. Uh, while uh, if you decide to, to use the direct puncture of, of the jugular veins, uh, in many cases, it, uh, it can be very technically difficult. Right and the left. Left side uh, allows a much easier assessment of left iliac vein, ascending lumbar veins, and the left renal vein. Uh, on the contrary, uh, right femoral access makes uh, angioplasty on the left uh, internal jugular veins and azygos vein easier, at least in some cases. Regarding angiographic uh, contrast, there is a problem whether to use diluted or non-diluted contrast. Uh, in terms of diluted contrast, it allows better visualization of endoluminal structures, such as valve, leaflets, and so on, uh, while non-diluted contrast allows better opacification of collaterals and better estimation of overall, overall features of the veins. Also, controversy exists regarding whether this uh, contrast should be hand or pressure injected. Uh, and while hand injection mimics physiological venous flow, pressure injectors are more accurate, reproducible, and make some flow-related analysis quantifiable. Uh, there was a suggestion that 
perhaps some uh, modern injectors should be used which allow low pressure administration of contrast. Also, a controversy exists uh, regarding um, uh, interpretation of venography. Uh, one point is that all these veins should be assessed in the same manner, the definition should be the same for all these veins. However, we, we know that uh, in many patients these veins are asymmetric, the flows are asymmetric, uh, the anatomy of intracranial uh, sinuses is also asymmetric, and perhaps different approach should be used in cases with symmetric and asymmetric drainage. We don't know which approach at the moment is correct. Interpretation of narrowings and VARs, definition of pathologic versus uh, pathologic VAR. Uh, some doctors uh, think that jaguar valve or valve in the vein is abnormal if as narrowing at this level is detected. The question is also uh, which uh, degree of uh, such a narrowing is pathologic, whether it is 50 percent, 40 or so, we don't know. Uh, others opt um, for interpretation that such a valve should be interpreted as abnormal only if some flow disturbances are seen. Of course, uh, we don't know uh, what is the reality in the healthy population, and perhaps if uh, some studies uh, in the healthy in the individuals will be done, uh, we'll uh, know more, and this interpretation would be much easier. But unfortunately, not now. This, the same uncertainties apply also to the azygos vein. It should be remembered that there are some anatomical uh, features of uh, azygos vein which are not necessarily pathological. Maybe it's just a reflection of normal pathology or very um, different anatomy in this area, which is not necessarily abnormal. Also, a controversy exists uh, at the moment which lesions narrowing should be treated, addressed, uh, some doctors opt to, to, to uh, manage all detected lesions, all detected stenosis, but uh, the alternative approach is to uh, manage uh, only the most severe or perhaps only this easy and safe to treat. And there are several questions. For, for example, should we treat the uh, non-obviously stenosis uh, jaguar valves? Some doctors opt to, to do angioplasty in every uh, vein, even if venography seems normal. Whether it is a uh, correct approach or not, we, we simply don't know. Perhaps those who uh, try to do, to do such procedures uh, are right, because uh, maybe some lesions are not visible on venography, simply we don't know. Also, uh, there's a big controversy whether we should uh, address stand obviously stenosed veins which are not obviously involved in CCSVI or neurologic pathology such as iliac renal veins. So some doctors think that, uh, think that the only internal jugal veins and azygos veins should be uh, done, others opt also for such procedures in the vertebral iliac renal lumbar territories. But it should be remembered that the more extensive examination is, the higher the contrast load. Uh, in this such a case, um, there is a higher risk of renal failure, uh, iatrogenic vascular image injuries and also the dose of radiation is higher. While clinical benefit for, uh, from additional procedures is not very clear. 
The controversy also exists regarding so-called phasic stenosis. Uh, we don't know if it should be interpreted as uh, a pathology or not, but uh, it's already known that balloon angioplasty in, in the case of so-called phasic stenosis uh, most likely will be not very successful, while stenting is uh, in a case of this phase stenotic uh, is associated with, with quite a high risk of stent migration or other complications. So perhaps such lesions should no, not be treated, at least at, at the moment. Uh, there's a proposal uh, in some publications to, to have a gradient scale but of course uh, this is only a proposal and perhaps other case would be better. Should we assess uh, obvious problems in intracranial territory? Uh, this controversy uh, applies also to the venography of intracranial sinuses. Uh, also we are not very sure. There is some, uh, some risk, maybe not very high, but uh, such a risk exists why the clinical benefit is not very clear. And perhaps uh, we should uh, just wait a little until the, there will be more uh, data regarding uh, angioplasties in more safe uh, milieu. Another problem, how to evaluate the, and manage uh, stenosis in the upper part of internal jugal veins, especially in the level of uh, jugal foramen. Uh, should we interpret the vein as pathologic according to diameter measurements? How should we measure uh, this diameter in which, which point it is known that uh, firstly uh, there is a physiologic uh, narrowing in this area. Also, uh, the diameter of the vein in this area changes uh, if the head is rotated to the one or the other side. Also, should we uh, look at flow disturbances, uh, backflow in of injected contrast, and what is the best mode of management in this area? Is, if, uh, is the procedure safe here or, or rather not? There are some pro and contrast, uh, contrast regarding angioplasty in this territory. Uh, and uh, all of these procedures have some advantages and disadvantages. And the final problem is what is the role for IVUS. Uh, in the assessment of CCSVI. At the moment, only some colleagues perform this examination, and those who perform IVUS are very optimistic about it. So, in conclusion, since we are lacking sound data backing uh, a particular venographic protocol, no consensus document can be created at the moment. However, doctors should be aware of pro and contrast associated with different venographic techniques and which is very important since venographic protocols differ significantly between the centers, it is strongly suggested that any publication of CCSVI should include detailed description of venographic technique used and if uh, the procedure was done, detailed definition of pathological result of venography. So at least having detailed data in publication uh, with time we have more data and perhaps we will be closer to a consensus. Thank you very much. Outstanding uh, question. I have a question for you, Hector Ferral, interventional radiology from Chicago. Um, I didn't quite understand the concept of phasic stenosis. What is phasic stenosis? Is this is a narrowing which is not visible permanently during venography, but changes. It is visible for either for a fraction of cardiac cycle or changes during respiration. For example, it is visible on, the, on inspiration or, or vice versa. 
or with changing of position of the body. Uh, a perfect example was given uh, previously by uh, Professor Haki on this, on this MRV and this stenosis on the azygos vein, which disappeared completely when, when the patient turned his posi position to the, to the abdomen. Well, then, then maybe that's not a true lesion, right? Yeah, so exactly. Okay, thank you. As an MS patient, I can't reserve to let that one completely go by because Dr. Hickey's example said certainly when you turned the patient over, had them effectively on their hands and knees with their stomach hanging free, mm -hmm. that the azagas looked completely normal. So that works well for any of us that go through our life on our hands and our knees. <laughs> but I want you to, to think about if a person is symptomatic in those formats, so maybe there is time to tie in the two pieces. Because some of us may have a very physiologically reduced, either by the heart, most commonly, or whatever. So anyway, I think we have to put it in context. Because I've had many people talk to me, patients, and say, well, they didn't treat it because when I took a big breath, I was good. Except, they say, I still have those problems and I can't go through a life with only a big breath. So I just want to look at the other side from the patient's standpoint in those considerations, because I know there's two different thoughts, school of thoughts as far as treatment. Uh, perhaps you are right, but the major problem regarding this, this kind of pathology, or no, 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 not a pathology, is that, uh, of course, we, uh, can perform this examination and give a diagnosis of stenosis, uh, and then what? We know that uh, simple angioplasty most likely will not work in such a case. Also, we know uh, that stenting, because uh, in many cases, uh, at least in initially, uh, we, 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 are, we, are, we are implanting stenting in, in these this cases, and unfortunately, the, complication uh, uh, rate in such cases is very high. So it seems that stenting, perhaps it works, but is not very safe. Uh, and maybe a solution e exists, but we don't know which one. <laughs> I just have to say that most people are sitting there with their uh, knees bent, so most of you have uh, popliteal vein stenosis. So there's an awful lot of stents that are needed. So we have to, we really have to figure that one out. Okay, uh, our next speaker is Dr. Siddiqui, who will talk about our discussions on intravascular ultrasound. Um, so, Again, just like every other consensus document that has been talked about today, we don't really have consensus on IVIS either. Um, so what I'd like to do is um, just go through what intravascular ultrasound is for the majority of people in this room who may not really be routinely utilizing this technology. And in the end, uh, share some statements uh, that uh, we shared in a, in a brief in, informal session yesterday. Uh, my disclosures are quite numerous. I do serve as a consultant to a wide variety of endovascular companies. I have NIH grants, um, I have financial interests, and hopefully this just proves that I do have some ideas to what I'm talking about. Um, but none are related directly to the topic under discussion MS. So. Uh, Angiography has been considered the gold standard for evaluation of vascular disease. The problem is that it is really a luminogram, so it provides a shadowing of the vessel wall um, and uh, fills the contents. And in fact, actually, the term used is opacifies the lumen, means blinds everything that might be in the lumen. 
uh, when it does that. And so it really doesn't give us much information as to what might actually be inside the lumen, doesn't give us a lot of information. In fact, it gives us no information as to what might be in the wall, except shows the indentations. Um, and currently, there are really no studies which are comparing intravascular ultrasound uh, with catheter venography. So intravascular ultrasound, IVUS, uh, is a, a special ultrasound probe on the tip of a microcatheter which you can move up or down on top of a wire through any vascular structure that it may be uh, used for evaluation. It has its widest reported utilization during uh, arterial angiography, uh, primarily of the coronary arteries, and is routinely used by interventional cardiologists to evaluate wall structure, plaque structure, stability, and sizing for treatment uh, of uh, coronary vessels. Uh, we routinely use it, as do many others, for carotid uh, artery disease as well. Uh, you basically emit sound waves from the catheter tip, and then you collect them, and that creates an image. Um, and uh, just like Doppler ultrasound, like Angela uh, showed uh, earlier, it creates a, a very clear image. It's a real-time image and provides a nice thin section through the surrounding circumferential anatomy that surrounds the probe. And this is what it sort of looks like. Um, you see a cross-section of the vessel. Here, this is the vein. The probe is in the very middle where these crosshairs meet. And you can see the vessel wall. There's the hyperechoic wall. Uh, depending on how far away the probe is and if the vessel wall is really far away, you may not get that good of an image. And then you can create sagittal reconstructions of the vessel wall. Uh, its uh, main use, I dis uh, distinctly talked about this already. Um, and so what I'd like to do now is share with you some of the uh, advantages that we believe might, this pro may provide. It shows structure, structures within the vessel wall. Uh, it can verify the existence of the stenosis which may have been noted on catheter venography. Um, and currently, it's the only way to perform ultrasound of the azagous vein. Um, you can't do that with standard techniques. Um, and it appears to be significantly less operator dependent, but much more so interpreter dependent than conventional and, uh, Doppler sonography. Disadvantages, it is expensive. There are only a handful of companies that provide these uh, probes and technology. Um, and it's certainly invasive. You can't do this uh, without having intravascular access. Uh, if the vessel wall is really large, you need to change the size of your probe. Uh, with it comes expense. Uh, certainly requires uh, training and can be time consuming. So here I would like to share some of the data that we uh, were able to acquire as part of our prospective randomized trial uh, evaluating uh, uh, eva mendovascular therapy, basically venous angioplasty in patients who had CCSVI and MS. This was a collaboration between the department that I represent, Department of Neurosurgery, and the Jacobs Neurologic Institute, Bianca weinstock Gutman, and the Buffalo Neuroimaging Analysis Center, Robert Zivadnov. Um, and these are the authors for this uh, study. It's uh, an IAB-approved study. It does not include uh, usage of stents, multi-departmental collaboration. And we wanted to do a prospective randomized sham control trial to look at venous angioplasty versus sham angioplasty in patients with MS. Two phases. The first was open label, where all patients were treated. They knew they were treated. The second phase is uh, one patient away from completion, and that was double-blinded and randomized. Uh, the first 10 patients really allowed us to uh, clarify our protocols as we proce proceeded with these uh, procedures. And so there's some discrepancy as to exactly what data was collected, but certainly there's no discrepancy in terms of uh, procedures performed for the randomized phase. Uh, catheter venography involved uh, visualization of the azicus, right and left IJs. I was, perf was performed across the suspected stenotic lesions in the first phase and in all veins in the second phase. The device we used was uh, Volcano uh, provided it. Um, it's called the Eagle Eye Platinum Catheter. 
and the parameters that we were looking for included uh, intraluminal defects that have been talked by multiple speakers, uh, including septi, multi-channel veins, intraluminal hyperechoic filling defects, double parallel lumens, thickened walls, and presence of reduced pulsatility. Many of these parameters we picked up as we performed these procedures and said, well, what is this? Let's look at how often that is there. Interestingly, what we noted uh, for the azygous vein were that we identified intraluminal defects of one kind or another in over 88% of patients. Pulsatility was reduced uh, in about 40% and stenosis was demonstrated in about 50%. In the IJ, the intraluminal luminal defects were detected in about 32%, pulsatility was reduced in about 65%, and stenosis was noted in about 36%. In the right IJ, a similar distribution of these defects was noted. So I just want to sort of show some of these images to you, um, some of these still, and then I'll try to show some video images. Here's a classic example of what a stenosis looks like on IVUS, where the vein wall is directly hugging the IVUS probe right in the center. And you can see that on the sagittal reconstruction as well. What's interesting is the appearance of the stenotic segment. It appears to be heterogeneous, hyperechoic in areas, hypoechoic in others. Um, exactly what that is, we don't know. Uh, I was very interested to hear what Dr. Fox had to show earlier, but again, it'll be, I'll be interested to see what happens with the histology in these patients as to if the wall structure is different in MS patients compared to others. Now these are the visual images that we are all used to. This is what a stenosis looks like on the azygous vein. Again, classic appearance, or what we suspect CCSVI is all about retrograde venous reflux all the way up and down the spinal canal, suggesting that there's delayed venous emptying of the spinal cord and resultant neurologic dysfunction. We suspect that the angioplasty results in resolution of that epidural plexus, which we believe should correlate with improved clinical outcome. We don't have that data yet. Uh, study is not complete. These studies, these stenoses can be noted by MRV, has been shown. Reflux can be noted by ultrasound and detected in bidirectional flow on ultrasound. Now let's just move to what happens when you look at these lesions uh, in the IVUS. So what you're seeing here is a heterogeneous signal filling the entire lumen of the vein, and the vein uh, is hugging the walls of the IVUS. This is what it looks like on angiography. This is what it looks like on a compliant balloon, and we expect some improvement in results. So I'll, let me just quickly skip to the first part. This is an, a video, and I'll share a few videos primarily for education purposes. This is the wall of the vein. Question is, what is this structure filling the vein? This is surround, it's clearly within the wall of the vein, but it's hyperechoic, it's crescenteric, it's not layering like blood. This looks like chronic thrombus. And then inside you see these luminance, uh, these hypoechoic areas which look like vascular channels. So we're not quite sure exactly what this is. Sal and I were having a discussion. We suspect that this may be uh, what we are calling just simply uh, intraluminal hyperechoic filling defects, but this could be thrombus, there could be something else. Uh, and here is another example of this. So this is what we saw. So is this the beginning of a septa, is this the end of a septa, is this what they all started off with, is this the beginning of a double lumen. This is what the phasic stenosis uh, looks like. So here's what we believe is good respiratory pulsatility. Look at that. Now that's not stenosis, that's what the azygous and juggler veins routinely do. This is the azygous, uh, where you can clearly see the vein dilates and then shrinks with each respiratory movement. This is not something you routinely appreciate on catheter venography. And uh, this is certainly very, very useful uh, in, in distinguishing. Now, let's see something where you don't see that. Here's another one. That I believe you, me, this patient is breathing. And again, there's just nothing like that happening. This wall is severely stiff. There's a filling defect as well along the wall. 
The wall appears maybe a little thicker than what you just previously saw. And then there's just no respiratory variation in this case. And it's progressing to an area of concentric stenosis. Again, hugging the probe, hyperechoic mixed density signal. Is this a stenotic valve? I don't know. Is this chronic organized thrombus? I don't know. Uh, but these are findings that are giving you so much more detail than what you would normally expect to see. Look at the probe. You just saw this is the same vein that was that large. There was no respiratory variation. And here now the probe is hugging, uh, is being hugged by the venous uh, wall. Here's another example of multiple small channels. So here is again the this is an area of stenosis, and you see these multiple areas of what look like lumens within the parent vessel larger lumen. So these are multiple collateral channels going through, going alongside this venous uh, wall, uh, and then they will merge with the parent lumen. Other times they will uh, remain outside, but this is, again, exactly what this is is unclear, but this is correlated with severe stenosis on venous angiography. And you can see these parallel lumens on sagittal reconstructions. Here's an example of what we find rather commonly after cathervenography. Many times in cases where there sometimes isn't even a noted stenosis, which is contrast stasis five minutes after the injection was performed. And here's an example of what it will look like on, on intravascular ultrasound. Again, you see there is reduced pulsatility. And as you get closer, you start actually seeing contrast that will let out in just another second or two. This is just the carotid. But you can see, again, there's the wall of this vein appears to be much thicker than some of the other ones that we have noted. And as you get closer to the valve, there is the layering of contrast that just sits there. And each time there is reflux, you see a little bit of spillage and turbulence within this blood contrast layered within this enlarged, reduced sleep, I mean, reduced pulsatility within the, within the jugular. Exactly what the significance of this is uh, certainly not quite. Uh, clear. We also have the situation where we have dual lumen and septi. Here, uh, you see that there is clearly a second lumen, and there is a septa that is within it. The wall of the vein, I believe, is this. Now, is this congenital? Is this organized thrombus with resolution with septi in between? These are questions that remain. Uh, Unclear. Here's another example of this vein that clearly starts differentiating. Actually, this is the repeat of the same video. But exactly, is this um, uh, a stunted valve? Probably not. This is what we typically call septi, and you can see this in sagittal recons. And Sal was showing me some of his images, and they are identical to this. Uh, it's important to sometimes identify these stenoses. For instance, here's the azagus, and you would say this is definitely stenotic. It meets those definitions. The vein is hugging uh, the, the probe. But the fact of the matter is that you just simply ask the patient to take a deep breath, and you'll see that the probe is being hugged, and then a deep breath opens it wide up. And so there's certainly no narrowing or stenosis that is noted here. But again, you see good respiratory pulsatility in these cases where we expect this is normal. So conclusions, I mean, detailed IVUS uh, definitely showed us a lot of anomalies, more so than we had ever anticipated based on catheterobenography. Uh, it was most common in the azagus vein in our series and less common in the others. Um, the consensus discussion we found was, is IVUS absolutely needed? We did not have consensus on that. Certainly the ones that were used routinely feel that we do. Others uh, do not. But we did concur that there is
pro additional helpful information that's garnered by IVIS that makes it a really useful tool. It appears that it may be slightly less helpful for IJV because you have very good Dopplers. If you have a very good Doppler, you can detect many of these findings. But certainly, it's much more so helpful for Azicus where uh, Doppler information is simply not available. We also believe for the same reason that it may also be very helpful for evaluation of the brachycephalic. Um, we also believe that it may be also very useful for sizing of the vessel when you're considering balloons because uh, the asymmetric projection during venography may provide you an uh, aberrant information in terms of the optimal diameters. Um, is it helpful endpoint assessment? We also feel that angiography will not simply show you all the residual septi or malformed valves that IVIS clearly does show you much better detail. Um, and especially helpful when angiographically the vein appears to be normal. The drawbacks, as mentioned earlier, cost and large vessel size and poor penetration. And future advances, we really hope that uh, Boston Scientific and Volcano would incorporate information on directional flow, uh, information on velocities, and uh, maybe someday optical coherence tomography. Uh, thank you. Any, any questions? Okay, thanks. So we have an abstract to present. The doctor? Doctor? Dr. Morovich, sorry, I don't know you, um, will give um, an abstract on consensus on ultrasound for CCSDI's reading criteria. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, in the next few minutes, uh, we will review the five recently published uh, CCSVI uh, screening ultrasound criteria, um, and I will show you some uh, quick examples. I think that we all agree that an idea behind this consensus is to have reproducible and uh, comparable results between all of us. So criteria number one, which is now revised and accepted, say, states this. Uh, it's a bidirectional flow in one or both of the internal jugular veins in both postures or bidirectional flow in one position with absence of flow in the other position and or reversal or bidirectional flow in one or both vertebral veins in both positions. So now just you have to look quickly and compare the top with the bottom picture when on top you can see normal flow and on the bottom you can see a reflux of 0 0.88 second duration which is considered um, a criterion. On this picture uh, on the right side you can see the arrow pointing to the reflex with the probe in the transverse position. The same thing is pointing this yellow arrow to the red part of the lumen and you can see the reflex with the probe. Uh, this just shows an example of how uh, it is very important to set the machine settings properly. On the left side, the reflex is not visible because of the wrong PRF, while on the right side, the reflex is visible while, when we set the PRF correctly. These are movies, so I don't think we have time. Criteria number two states bidirectional flow in the intracranial veins and sinuses. This is actually put as an additional criteria due to the availability or unavailability of the software in certain centers. Criteria number three says it is a reduction of IJV cross-sectional area in supine position to be less than 0.3 centimeters squared, which does not increase with Valsalva maneuver and or intraluminal defects such as flaps, septa, or malformed valves combined with the hemodynamic changes. And also in this criteria, we uh, examine the valves. Uh, this is an example on top with a CSA reduction of uh, less than 0 0.3 centimeters squared. And on the bottom, you can see an interluminal defect in the B mode imaging. Uh, here, they're both uh, the same septum, one with color, one without. And I think that here, uh, uh, the movie is not, it's not moving, but um, if we could see the movie, you would see the valve not uh, moving properly. This is an example of stenosis of the internal jugular vein over here. Sorry, uh, this movement was to try and get the movie going. 
Uh, about valve mobility, on the left side uh, you can see a normal open valve during inspiration and the same valve closed during expiration. We examine the valves with the M mode and if you take a look at the yellow arrows, on the top image you can see it pointing to the hyperechoic line which is uh, a wavy line showing uh, that it is actually a mobile valve. Well, on the bottom picture, you see uh, the immobile valve and the line is almost straight. Criteria number four is absence of detectable flow in the internal jugular vein and or vertebral vein despite numerous deep inspirations in both sitting and upright positions or in one posture absence of detectable flow in the internal jugular vein and or vertebral vein despite numerous deep inspirations and bidirectional flow detected in the same other position, uh, in the other position on the same side. This is an example of absence of flow. Criteria number five is a cross-sectional area of the internal jugular vein being greater in the sitting position than in the lying position, or it appears unchanged despite the change in posture. Over here, uh, it is one patient and on top, uh, you can see an example of the CSA measurement in the supine position uh, being much smaller than the CSA measured in the sitting position in the same person. Here we have an example of the CSA measurement in supine and in sitting position being unchanged. All of the measurements uh, have to be performed on both sides and in both positions, both sitting and lying. And you have to remember that criteria number one and four are considered positive only if they're present in both positions. And we need at least two criteria to be positive to, for a diagnosis of CCSUI to be considered. Thank you. My question is, <clears throat> you know, uh, uh, related to your final comment, uh, uh, because uh, we have experience, uh, which means two criteria need to be present for CCSY to be considered, but now we are not considering the criteria number two. So uh, uh, I can tell you the experience in our premise study. Uh, the, the criteria for inclusion in the premise study was to have two extracranial criteria fulfilled. Mm -hmm. uh, it took a long effort and a lot of screen failures to find patients with uh, uh, two criteria fulfilled extracranially. And uh, I'm just saying that uh, uh, before we even publish this, and, and uh, uh, I, I'm not sure that we can say, because now we don't have five criteria, we have four criteria, and two should be positive. It's a totally different scenario where we don't know how many patients will be positive with the two criteria anymore. And, and so I'm saying until we go back and maybe we should contact all people who publish studies and, and, and uh, or, or central ESI SNVD collect the data and see how this change. Uh, we, we can't say that the two criteria have to be fulfilled. Okay, yes, I completely agree with you. The whole idea behind this is collecting more data from uh, most centers and gathering all the ideas and opinions of all the people who actually do ultrasound of the veins. 